yeah, no, no, it's not up to me. I'm not going to, I'm not going to stop. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 9. If you don't have a Bible, uh, you're out of luck because they're all gone at the back. Um, that's a good sign. So hopefully you have a Bible you can look on with. Oh, Kent has some more that he's put back there. Um, Luke chapter 9, if you don't know where that is, you can go to your table of contents in the book, in your Bible, and find uh, where it is. The Gospel of Luke. So, if you have been with us for at least a year and a bit, you'll know, maybe you forgot, um, and that's okay, I forgive you, but around this time last year, we had been going through Luke, and we stopped in Luke chapter 9. And it was like, yeah, I looked in my notes, and it was around this time, April of 2021, that we had stopped. And there's a reason why um, in Luke chapter 9, because there's sort of a pivot, a shift in the way that the gospel goes. And the way that the Lord is leading us to go through Luke is actually quite slow. It's not like we're just taking a whole chapter at a time. Therefore, if we would continue on in Luke, it would just take us years. Um, So we're just going to keep dipping our feet back into Luke. And uh, as I was thinking after we finished our Jonah uh, series last week, of where, where we are to go. I, I just started reading where we left off, and it just, the Lord just made a click, and like, this is where we need to go. Right, jump back into Luke. So that's what we're going to be doing. And again, we are never moving beyond discipleship, right? Discipleship is our following after Jesus, our imitating Him, our learning from Him, Him being our rabbi. We are His students. We're like Mary at His feet, just looking up at Him and saying, okay, what next? What now? Teach me the truth. Show me. We never move beyond that. So as we jump back into Luke, we're not putting on our scholarly hats and tucking in our shirts and learning all the Greek and just making sure that we can know it perfectly. We do want to know it. And thankfully, the Holy Spirit is the one that helps us understand it. But the point is for us to follow uh, Jesus. So as we're looking in Luke, we are going to be following Jesus in his journey from Galilee as he makes his way down to Jerusalem and where he dies and he rises again and ascends into heaven. We want to follow him so that we can learn best who we are, because we're in him now, and uh, we want to hear from him, because he is the one, he's the way, the truth, and the life. So if we want to know the way, you follow Jesus. If we want to know the truth, follow Jesus. If you want to have life, you follow Jesus, and that's what we want to do um, as a church. But this is a recap. What is Luke all about? Well, firstly, it's, it is a gospel. So a gospel, there's four gospels. The gospel is kind of used in those two ways. It's the good news, but it's also the good news of Jesus, sort of just his life and his death and his resurrection. And in our Bibles, we have four portraits, right, of, of Jesus' life on earth, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So Luke is one of those. And why is that important? Because Jesus is God's sort of solution and God's answer and God's really uh, the, the kind of the, the way that he shows that he loves the world. Right, Because way back in the Garden of Eden, when God made everything, he made it perfect. It was the ideal picture where he made the world for his glory. He made the world so that uh, the world would show how creative he was, how glorious he was, how perfect he was. He made birds and the you know, sea and all that kind of stuff, but he made humans, right? Sort of the pinnacle as his creation to be his specific image bearers. So that when the birds and the mountains and the sun and look at... Uh, humans, they would see something of God, right? So back in the uh, ancient times, the ancient Roman times, you'd have Caesar, and in all of these various uh, towns, uh, they would have, they would sculpt these sculptures of Caesar, right? And oftentimes, they emphasize the muscles and everything, so even if the Caesar was not very muscular, these, these statues made them look very, you know, uh, very muscular, but the point was, is that in each of these little towns, because Caesar could, was only one person at one time, so in each of these towns, people would see the statue, and they would be reminded, oh, that is Caesar, he is king, this is what he is like, right? Now, oftentimes, they would lie, because they're not that muscular, but this is what Caesar is like, he is king. In a very, very similar way, we are made in God's image and likeness. We are like living statues. So we're personal, right? And we're unique, each and every single one of us. But each of us are living statues of God. That God has made, male and female, he's made us to go and to show one another, to show himself and show the world that God is king, that God is good, that God is creative, right? We are actually called to have dominion over the world in the same way that God has dominion over the world. We are his little kings and little queens, uh, to reflect him. This is how God made everything, and it was all so, so uh, perfect.
perfect until the enemy of God, who is a fallen angel, an angel, Lucifer, who wanted to become better than God and put himself, raise himself higher than God in the, in the throne room, he was cast down to earth and he took the form of a serpent and he deceived the first man and the first woman. He deceived them into believing, this is so important, into believing that if you disobey God and eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will have a better life. It'll be better for you. God's holding out on you. God said, don't eat of it. Well, I'll tell you why. Because if you eat of it, you'll know good and evil, and you're going to be wise, right? And Eve's like, ooh, that sounds awesome. It looks like a good fruit. It looks yum, right? It's good. Yummy. Um, and and uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm talking baby talk. My goodness. Um, I just got to pause for a minute. Britt and I, before we had Primrose, we were like, we are never going to use baby talk because it's so silly. As soon as Primrose was born, it, blah, 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 you just have to. Um, anyways, uh, but sometimes it comes out in your, just your regular talk. So the enemy deceives Adam and Eve into eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And at that point, we learn later on in Scripture that sin, which is that disobedience of God and living for oneself, turning our backs to what God wants and living for ourselves, that has permeated, um, has permeated all of the world. And because of sin, there's the consequence of death. And this is why we have death. Death was never part of the original intention. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, we see that death is the last enemy that God is going to destroy through his son, Jesus Christ. So when anyone ever dies, we can grieve just as Jesus did and know this is not right. This is not right because this is never the way that it was um, supposed to be. But thankfully, Jesus is the resurrection and the life. But anyways, we're getting carried away. Yesterday, when we were walking around on Saturday to do some outreach, uh, I came across this, uh, this lady, and it, it, behind her ear, there was this tattoo of a snake right behind her ear. And it looked like a snake. It was this curly thing, and it, I didn't get a good look. I didn't want to, that'd be weird. It's like, hey, let me look. But it was there. And instantly, as I saw this, it would just gave me this perfect illustration how so many of us, even us as Christians, can so often continue to listen to the serpent's deception all the time, deceiving us into saying, this is better for you. Oh, do this. Oh, God said do this. No, that's okay. Don't worry about it. You can still believe in God, but hey, do this instead. Just constantly, constantly, constantly listening to deception. So all of us can get so caught up in, in that. But eventually, because God loves his people, he loves the world. This is what we, Jonah was all about la like the last few weeks, is that God has a heart for this world. He doesn't just look at us like, you know, he could have looked at Nineveh and say, well, they're all violent, they're abusive, they're all just, have, they're serving sin, my justice will just come over them and it'll all be okay. Like, no, he doesn't do that. He sends people. He sent Jonah to be like, no, like, my heart is for Nineveh. In fact, in Ezekiel, he speaks through the, uh, the prophet Ezekiel and says, is it my hope and my wish that the wicked perish? No, that's not my hope. That, I don't want that at all. This is God's heart. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. My hope is that they would hear me, obey me, and live. That's God's heart for life, for life to be given to every single human being. That is God's heart. So through this little nation called Israel, God devises this plan to bring salvation to the whole world. And Jesus is the one that comes out of this, this uh, kind of... Uh, soil of Israel, Jesus appears as the, as the life for the whole world. Now, the purpose of Luke's gospel is so cool, because if you know Luke, many believe him to be a physician, okay? So, if you, if you know any physicians, they're probably not, you know, uh, what's the difference between type A, type B? I always forget, Brett. Left brain, right brain, but who's what, one of which? Okay. Physicians, they're, they're, they're focused on details. You don't really want a very emotional musician doing brain surgery on you. Uh, you want someone with attention to detail doing these things. And Luke, this is kind of like who Luke was. He paid attention to detail. In fact, if you look at the end of the book of Acts, when he's explaining Paul's um, time on the, the ship, when it gets shipwrecked and they end up going to Malta, the detail that Luke describes of the hoist and the sails and the billows and all these things is amazing to see his attention to detail. At the beginning of Luke, this is what Luke writes, and you don't have to turn there, but let me just read it. And just listen to the way that Luke is writing, his purpose for writing this portrait of Jesus. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative, like a story in the history of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of this message 
have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also. So he recognizes there's other narratives of Jesus going around. He says, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. So you can see Luke there. He's like, now there's this Theophilus, whether he's a real person or not, or just like a name for a certain kind of people. The point is this. He wants to give Theophilus, he wants to give the world an orderly account from eyewitnesses of exactly what's going to happen, of what happened. That's the purpose of Luke. He's like, I'm a doctor, okay? I I like detail. I'm going to write down exactly what happened from these eyewitnesses, like Mary, the mother of Jesus, and others. What happened? How did it work? So that he can give it to say, hey, look, Theophilus, you can have certainty. So that Theophilus, when he hears 20, 30 years after Jesus allegedly rose from the grave, right? He never saw it, but, you know, 30 years down the road, when he starts hearing people talk about this, now Luke's giving him a record saying, hey, look, these are from eyewitnesses. This happened. And for Theophilus, he'd be like, this is amazing. So that's kind of like the purpose, the specific purpose of Luke's gospel. Now, really quickly, I have to give the quick context of Luke 1 through 9, just for us to understand uh, where we are in Luke chapter 9. So, just buckle up here. This is going to be really fast, but I just want to give us a quick sort of summary of what's happened so far. Israel, the people of God, have been waiting for their Savior. Had they been waiting for this so-called Messiah that the prophets from centuries past, like Ezekiel and Isaiah, have been talking about. They kept saying, God's going to bring us someone, a king, that's going to bring justice, that's going to bring salvation, that's going to bring peace, because we're not experiencing any of that. And for Israel, they're just a little picture of the whole world, right? They're experiencing un- un- injustice and, and chaos and sin, just like the whole world. But there's a promise of one that's going to come that's going to change everything, okay? So, they're waiting, they're waiting and waiting, but that person hasn't come until an angel appears to an old priest named Zechariah. Now, this angel promised Zechariah that his barren wife, uh, Elizabeth, would become pregnant, which was almost laughable because they were beyond that time, biologically, and that their son, who would be John the Baptist, would be the one that would actually prepare the way for God to send this anointed one, send this Messiah. John the Baptist, he would call people to turn right, from their old ways and turn toward God, be baptized in water, and prepare them for forgiveness of sins. Well, months passed, okay, months pass and the promised anointed one from long ago becomes a present reality. Jesus Christ is born and he is called the Christ. And Christ is not Jesus' last name, it's not Mary and Joseph Christ. Uh, Christ is the Greek for anointed one. Jesus, the anointed one. Jesus was the anointed one and he is. And now for about three decades, Jesus lives a relatively quiet life. Okay, he just works under his dad. And then in direction from God his Father, He begins ministering to Israel after John prepared his way. He ministers as the promised one who has come to bring about the promised realities that they've been waiting for. Justice for the oppressed, good news to the poor, healing for the sick. I mean, this is what they were promising about this anointed one. And finally, Jesus is doing this and he's garnering lots of popularity. These things like justice, salvation, and peace are what characterize the kingdom of God that Jesus invites us all into. And Jesus, he's the entrance to this kingdom. So in Luke's gospel, we see that Jesus begins to demonstrate and to declare the good news of the kingdom. And to demonstrate it. Demonstrate his power, like healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons, and even he is the son of God, forgiving sin. Now, as we saw over a year ago, Jesus has become very, very popular, but also, specifically amongst a certain amount of people, very despised and hated. And who didn't like him? It was those religious leaders. It was the churches, you could say, in our vernacular. The synagogue leaders. The, the religious types. Those that have got their PhDs and everything with their tucked in shirts and they're up there and everyone's looking at them. Kind of like pastors today, right? It was those that hated Jesus. Because to them, Jesus is breaking all of their spiritual rules. But Jesus knows, and we know from the Gospels, that these rules are only their rules, Right? not God's. So when, when these, these Pharisees, that's what they're called, and these Sadducees, these scribes, they see, let's say, Jesus and his disciples eating food before washing their hands, they're like, this is wrong. You have to wash your hands. And they, they, they made that such a, a spiritual rule and command that you must wash your hands in order to be clean. 
but, but they're not doing it, so he ruffled their feathers. And Jesus says, it doesn't matter what you put into your mouth, it's what comes out of your mouth. And they're just like, God, you're right, but I don't like you, you know? Um, the one command of the Pharisees I do agree with over Jesus, I can't believe I said that, but is washing your hands before your meal, by the way. I think that's a good thing. Uh, and I think Jesus probably thinks that too. But anyways, he's making a point. He's making a very strong point. Um, he's, he's, he, what he does is he, he, he obeys God's law to its fullest and truest um, extent. Not just in the way that the Pharisees have sort of manipulated it. Now, more closely preceding our text today, Jesus has been healing. He's been sending out his disciples on their own. So they've been watching him a lot through this. And now he's sending them out alone, two by two, with power and authority to heal and to preach and all these different things. Um, he's doing much more miracle, miracles, but he's also beginning to speak about his coming death and resurrection. In fact, in Luke chapter 9, um, it's a long chapter, but in this one chapter, you can see two different areas where he kind of just tells his disciples, his 12 apostles and those that follow, hey, I'm going to suffer, and I'm going to die, and then I'm going to rise again. Now, in their minds, they're listening to that, and they're like, Jesus, you're making no sense. I think, you know, all of your praying and preaching and casting out demons has just made you a little bit wonkers, because that doesn't make any sense for our idea of what the Messiah ought to be. Because our conception of the Messiah, our conception of the, of the Savior is going to be a physical king that's going to take his throne in Jerusalem. He's going to conquer these nasty Romans, and we're going to establish Israel as the one true nation. That, that's, that was their conception and their idea of, um, of the Messiah. So when Jesus says to them, hey guys, I'm going to die. It's like, they're like, what? This doesn't make any sense. But Jesus has been talking more and more about this. And then even more closely to our text was a, an instance where Jesus went up on this mountain and he was transfigured which means he was sort of put into this angelic spiritual state and Peter, James, and John saw him as he truly is, as the son of God. And the father says to them, hey, listen to this man, listen to him. And then when they come down the mountain, it turns out that the nine left over had been trying to cast out this demon from this little boy who was having these epileptic seizures from the demon, but they couldn't do it. And Jesus comes and he's frustrated because of the lack of faith and he basically casts out the demon and his disciples are kind of left humbled, let's say, uh, from their inability to do it. And then we get basically to our text. So let me read um, our text and it begins in verse 49. Verse 49. John answered, Master, speaking of Jesus, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he does not follow with us. Verse 50, but Jesus said to him, do not stop him, for the one who is not against you is for you. Verse 51, and this is the shift, the pivot verse. When the days drew near for him, Jesus, to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered the village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. So like I said earlier, this, this verse 51 is sort of a shift, where he's been doing all this ministry in the Galilee in the area there, and now he's shifting, and now his, his gaze is set towards Jerusalem. Why? Because Jerusalem is where he was to die, to rise and to ascend into heaven. So, I'm going to break this up into three parts. And the first is this. Set your face on mission. This is how it applies to us, that we ought to set our face on mission just as Jesus did as well. So, I'm going to skip verses 49 and 50 because I should have done that last year. Uh, but I'm going to do verse 51 and then we'll go back to verse 49 and 50 um, just after this. So, verse 51, look at that again. When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Now, the term taken up most likely refers to the ascension, okay? Um, ascension is so key. So Jesus died for our sins. He was raised again, but then he ascended into heaven. Now, why is the ascension so clear? The ascension is God exalting Jesus, basically saying, yes, I approve of your sacrificial death and resurrection, sacrificial death. I've raised you, and now I'm bringing you up, and I'm setting you above all principalities and powers. God the Father raises his son up as a way to exalt him and to say that all of what he did worked. 
and it was all so good. And also, Jesus says, if I don't go up, you won't receive the Holy Spirit. So if Jesus just rose from the grave and he was this supernatural, resurrected man, he could only still be in one place at one time, only able to do certain things at certain times with certain people. But what he did, and this is why the church is the body of Christ, he ascends to heaven, then he takes the promise of the Father, which is the Holy Spirit, which is the same spirit that he was anointed with, to heal, to preach, to cast out demons, and he gives it to the whole church. And that's why I believe Jesus says, greater works will you do when I go, and I must go. Because now Jesus is like, I'm going to multiply myself amongst the whole church. So the ascension is so clearly. So he recognized here, when the time came up for him to be taken up, Luke sees it. He knows, this is my time. This is my time of my exaltation. Jesus knew his time was coming. So he set his face. He knew his time was coming. So he set his face on the goal of his mission, right? To do his father's will, to redeem the world by his life, death, resurrection, ascension. And this is going to all take place in Jerusalem. And I love this, set your face. Your your translation might say he was steadfast or resolutely, like he was just resolute. Like this is what I am to do. It wasn't just another thing. It didn't like, oh, I still have my carpentry dreams. I still have my hobbies like fishing. I still have to do this and this. And then also, I got to go to Jerusalem. No, it it, it was fully set. It was totally set. And I love the idea of your face and the way that God has designed our senses, like hearing and seeing and smelling and speaking and everything. It's all facing one direction, right? When you look at something, your nose is in that direction to smell. Your, your, your words are there to, to speak out forward. Your ears are designed in such a way that it can come. If, you know, if someone's trying to talk to you behind you, oftentimes you can't hear them because your ears aren't formed that way. Everything is fo- put in that one direction. Jesus, he set his face toward Jerusalem. All senses in. Let's go. So you get this determination. You get this commitment. You get this um, priority and this compelling nature of what he is to do. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 4, Paul is, is encouraging his young, preaching, you know, trainee, Timothy. And he says, no soldier, he gives this analogy, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits because his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. And I love that. Maybe it, maybe it aligns more with those of you that are a little bit more like, uh, that just, you know, soldier in war, that kind of like, you get kind of amped up about that. But I love that. Jesus never got entangled with civilian pursuits. He never got entangled with money. Who cares about money? It comes and goes. It's not going to be here when we leave anyway. He never got entangled in, in relationships in the sense, well, this person has never forgiven me and I'm never going to forgive them. And then you just have this grudge that just like grows and grows and grows. He never got entangled in that. He never got entangled in his career. He never thought, well, Father, if I leave Galilee, then my whole life is going to be gone. I'm never going to be able to do carpentry anymore. Like, he never got entangled with that. He never got entangled with hobbies. You see, his aim was to do his Father's will. Whatever I hear you say, I'll say. Whatever I see you do, Father, I will do. His face was set. And I can imagine the Father throughout this time, because Jesus would go and he would spend a lot of time in prayer, sometimes all night, spending time with the Father. And I can imagine the Father just reminding Jesus, Son, you are going to bruise the head of the serpent. Remember. Genesis 3, right? Son, remember, in you and through you, all families of the earth shall be blessed. And Jesus is like, oh yeah, that's right. That, that Genesis 12 to Abraham, that's really for me. I gotta do that, that's right. Son, you're gonna be pierced for their transgressions. You're gonna be crushed for their iniquities. And Jesus, you can imagine his spirit, like his fleshly spirit's kind of dropped, like, oh yeah, that's right. Face set to Jerusalem. Son, your throne is gonna be established forever and I'm gonna exalt you. Jesus is like, okay, okay. So you can imagine this, okay, face is set. This is what I'm to do. From Genesis chapter 3 all the way through the prophets, the Father's reminding Jesus of who he is and what he is to do as the Son of God and the Son of Man. And Jesus set his face. How does this relate to our to us? Well, as Jesus set his face, we are to set our face on mission. And what is our mission? To glorify, to and to glorify is to show off. Okay, to show off God, to glorify God, to show the world who God is. And how do we do that? By pointing to Jesus. That's what God wants, to point to his son, Jesus Christ. And how do we then best make people see Jesus in the most fullest way? Do we just 
raise up a big crucifix and just show people? Do we just share pictures on Facebook of just, you know, this perfect white man with a perm with holding a lamb? Like, is that how we just show the world Jesus? No. The best way we show the world Jesus is by making them into a disciple of Jesus. The best way. So the way that we glorify God is to make disciples. That's why Jesus in Matthew 28 said, go and make disciples. He didn't say, go and hold conferences and worship me or whatever. He said, go and make disciples because that is what's going to cause God's glory to shine because that's how people most um, appropriately recognize, see, and experience Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So, brothers and sisters, I just want to encourage us, like, now is the time. As I, as I read this verse today, I was, I was walking kind of praying, Lord, what do you want us to preach on? And I read that verse, verse 51, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and instantly, I just felt our mission, like, now is the time. Now is the time for us to set our face on the goal, to set our face on Jesus, to set our face on our task to make disciples. Now is the time, not tomorrow, not when you feel like you're most ready, now is the time. I love it in, in Hebrews. The writer of Hebrews says, Today, if you hear his voice, and you have heard his voice, because we just read the word. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts like Israel did in the rebellion. Don't harden your hearts. Don't be like, ah, it's okay. I'm just going to wait because I, I have things to do. Don't. And this is for me too, because I'm just as guilty. Today, Isaac, is the day to set your face on mission. Today is the day. Don't let any second go to waste. Now is the time. So what does this look like? Well, set your face, set all your senses, set everything towards obeying God, right? And I'm taking this from Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20. Jesus told his disciples to go and meet him at a specific mountain, and that's the sort of the context and the environment where he gives the great commission. But in order for them to go there, they had to obey Jesus. Go to the specific mountain, and for us, we just got to be constant like those disciples and say, okay, God, what do you have for us? We'll do it. We'll go, right? And also, Jesus is the one who has all authority. So what right do we have to say, no thanks, Jesus, I'll do my own thing, right? We can't, we can't do that. So we are to set our face to obey God and his word. We are to set our face to make Jesus known, to make Jesus loved, to see Jesus followed all around us. We are to set our faces to see people die to their old lives Lives of, as, as slaves, as lives in brokenness, lives in, a, in, in um, shame and rebellion and addiction. To see them die to that old life and rise to their new lives in Christ. And that's shown in baptism. And we're so grateful to have done that so often this year so far. We are to set our faces to help and to counsel and to correct and encourage and teach others about how to obey Jesus. We are to set our faces to acknowledge in faith that Jesus is present with us all of the time. Consider the times today. I mean, I know that it's easy to look at our time as the worst time in history, but there's lots of crazy times in history. But consider our times today. We're born for, we were born for such a time as this, just like Esther was given that as well. We were born now for a reason. Consider what's going on around you. Wars, rumors of wars, so much identity confusion, so much depression and anxiety in the, in the West specifically, so much economic instability Consider the times and make an appeal today to say, look, I can focus on a number of these things and get totally overwhelmed or I could cut through all of this to the core issue and see people walk through the doors of hope, healing, and life. And I do that through making disciples. So I'm going to set my face. I mean, I'm, I'm going to put on those little things that the horses have on, right? To just have tunnel vision for that one thing and and just forget these things for a moment and focus on this. Because if I focus on this and see people come to know Jesus, then these things are not going to be as worrisome for that person. It matters more for them to know Jesus. Now, there's two things in our passage that can stump us and stifle us in this resolution and in this determination for us to set our faces on mission. And the first one is what we read in verses 49 and 50. I'm going to read it, and then I'll tell you what it is. John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, Do not stop him, for the one who is not against you is for you. What is the first thing that will stump us? Tribalism. 
tribalism, Christian tribalism. What is tribalism? Well, it's kind of what you would think it is. You kind of have your, your people, your beliefs, your ideas, your ways, your ministry efforts, your specific eschatological views, all of these things, and they're not of us. They're doing it wrong. We're only the ones doing it right. If they try to do something that we should be doing, we're going to try to stop them because they're not doing it right, and it's very dangerous if they do it. This is Christian tribalism. John sees a man successfully, he doesn't say this man was trying to cast out demons, he was casting out demons in Jesus' name, which is the appropriate way to do it. Not in the name of Beelzebub, not in the, you know, in the name of Baal. What, it's like, this is in the name of Jesus. He's trying to do this, and he's doing it. And remember, this is just after the disciples failed attempts, so they might have a little bit of pride issues. They couldn't cast out the demon of the boy, and now they're seeing someone successfully do it, and they're like, no, you can't do it. But why? Why did John and the disciples try to stop this person? Well, look at the end of verse 49. It can't be any clearer. Because he does not follow with us. Because they weren't part of our tribe. We're the right ones. He's not part of us. He's doing it differently, and we don't like that, and he's sort of taking on our goals and our mission, so they try to, to stump him. I can give you, I can tell you from a personal place, a personal uh, example of the effects of Christian tribalism, because I'm still a, a recovering Christian tribal, tri, uh, tribalitionist. I don't know how to, that, that, I don't even know if that's a real word, but I'm recovering. Um, and it's not, no one's fault, but when I was through Bible college and when I started working in some parachurch organizations and even into my time here, um, I sort of got sort of tunnel vision on one specific tribe within the Christian faith. And if anyone else is doing anything else differently, I was like, they're all doing it wrong, and I'm doing it right. I'm being very vulnerable with you now. But God has removed that, and I'm so thankful for that. It's amazing. But maybe some of you are still there, and I can help you through it, because I was there, and I'm still recovering from it. Um, but Christian tribalism will stump you from growth. Why? How? Because you totally lose sight of the mission. Because you're focusing on how everyone else is doing it wrong. And you're, you're, you're putting all of your time critiquing and criticizing everybody else that you forget the mission. You forget Jesus. Now, I want to be very clear here. I don't, when I say that, Jesus here is not saying, you know, it doesn't matter who, what name, you know, this man is casting out demons. It doesn't matter. No, it does matter. Essentials, True essentials of the gospel obviously are very, very important. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians that sometimes divisions are important, right, to see who really is of the faith. But when it comes to just different things, secondary issues, when it comes to just ministry in different ways, Jesus has a lot of grace and a lot of freedom. So as John and the disciples let tribalism get in the way of mission, um, we can let tribalism get in the way of us advancing the kingdom of God. So what is the solution here? We're to set our eyes on Jesus, right? When someone does ministry uh, differently. And there's two ways that we can protect ourselves from this. Less time setting our eyes in theology books and podcasts and, and YouTube videos, spending hours just seeing one certain way, and just more time setting our eyes on Jesus and his word. I know a friend who used to read tons of books, and finally he just felt convicted, I just want to be a master of one book, just this one. And again, that's not a knock on Christian books. I've been very, very helped, and I'm sure you have as well. Very, very helped. God has used many good books and podcasts and YouTube videos to help me, but we ought to spend the majority of our time in one book, hearing from one, looking at one person, and that is Jesus. And also, I think what will help us too, protecting us from tribalism, is spending less time setting our eyes on secondary issues and focusing really just specifically on one thing and spending all of our time on that um, rather than spending more time on just the true gospel and on Jesus and our mission. In Numbers 11, there was this situation where you had all these people that were, the Spirit came upon them and they were prophesying. This is in the time of Moses and in the camp of Israel's camp. And then there was these two others that the Spirit continued to rest on them. I forget their names, Eldad and something. And, and they were prophesying in the camp. And someone saw that and said, they shouldn't be doing that because they're not allowed. And then that person told Joshua, and Joshua was like assistant. And Joshua comes up to Moses and says, should we stop? This is wrong. And then Moses, he gives really the heart of God here. Moses says, oh, would that all of the Lord's people were prophets. Would that the Lord put a spirit on all of us. That's the heart of God. 
right? So where you have some that's like, no, they shouldn't be doing this because they're not ready or they're not qualified. They don't have their degrees. They don't have their masters. They haven't done Bible studies. The heart of God is like, no, would that all go and do mission? All, no matter what, you know, degrees they have. I think that's so, so important. Tribalism will stump our determination to accomplish our mission. The second thing that will stop us is anger, which springs from pride. In verses 52 to 56, we read this. Jesus sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him, but the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John saw it, who were rightly called sons of thunder, um, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. So the Samaritans did not like Jews, and the Jews did not like Samaritans. Samaritans were, the Jews would call them half-breeds, which is a very terrible term. Uh, You had, in ancient Israel, the kingdom sort of split in two in the time of Rehoboam. So you had Judah, kings of Judah, and then you had Israel split up here. So there were, there was the northern tribe of Israel, which were in Samaria, and then you had the southern tribe of Israel, which was just basically Judah, okay? And from that point on, sometimes they made alliances, but they would also get angry at each other, and there was like a brother and a sister that never got along, right? That's just kind of the idea. And eventually, uh, I think it was the Assyrians who came and uh, came into and took over, uh, took captive north, uh, the northern tribe of Israel, and then there was, you know, different races making families. So then you had the Samaritans that were part Jewish, part Gentile, and they were just seen as just a nasty bunch with their own uh, temple, their own everything, kind of based on this idea that they were already split years have passed. So there's just a big, big rift going on there. And uh, the Jews did not like them. Samaritans didn't like the Jews. And when the Jews wanted to travel up to Galilee, it would have been easy for them just to go straight up through Samaria, but they disliked Samaritans so much they would go all the way around, you know, over the, the river in Galilee, all, or, or over the river of the Jordan, and go all the way up on the east side, and then they would hop into Galilee because they did not like the Samaritans as, as, at all. But John, uh, Jesus, he just crosses all of those racial barriers, and I love it. He's just amazing, right? He talks to the woman at the well, a Samaritan. She's like, you're talking to me? A Samaritan and a woman? You know, because even at that time, it was like, you wouldn't talk. A man wouldn't talk to a woman like that. But Jesus just crosses all the lines that we put up, which I just love, because his heart is for the whole world. Now, from James and John's perspective, their anger does seem justified. Why? Well, because when Jesus sends some of his disciples into a little Samaritan village to prepare his coming, because, I mean, here's a small village. You might have a few dozen of disciples that would overwhelm the lodging and the food of a little town. So he wanted to send people to prepare it. Well, when they see that Jesus, this kind of prophet, is going to Jerusalem, they immediately disregard Jesus and say, we don't like him because he's part of those Jews down there. And we have our own temple here that we, that we just, so they disregarded him. So James and John's, John's their perspective, they, their anger seems a little bit justified. I mean, this is Jesus we're talking about. Come on, the Messiah, and you're not going to receive him? So they are very, very angry. And their minds may have thought of Elijah, the prophet in 2 Kings, who called down fire from heaven to consume these bad guys. It's pretty cool. Um, and, and their minds would have got there, like, well, if we have the same spirit now, we can do the same thing that Elijah did, and that would be, you know, very cool in their kind of sons of thunder way. So that's why Jesus' response is such a shock to them, Right? In fact, they get rebuked by Jesus. So that doesn't make any sense. Jesus, don't you see these Samaritans, these half-breeds, right, that intermix with the Gentiles, they're basically rejecting you, Jesus. We're not going to have a place to stay tonight. We're going to have to put our, rest our heads on rocks like Jacob did. I mean, this is terrible. And look, Elijah, he called down fire from heaven. Your father called down fire from heaven on Sodom and Gomorrah. Couldn't we do this here too? And Jesus says, he rebukes them. Not just, no guys, come on, let's do something else. He rebukes them. That's strong. Jesus says to James and John, no. Like strong rebuke, you are wrong. Well, it seems like a shock until we grasp the time, the spiritual time that Jesus was in. You don't have to go there, but I'm just going to read to you Luke, or sorry, John uh, chapter 3, and you'll get the idea of the time that um, Jesus was living in. John writes this, John verses six, uh, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And then verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Right? Hear that? He did not send him in, this, in the world to condemn the world, but 
in order that the world might be saved through him. Right? Jesus recognizes that the world is already condemned. They're already in sin. God so loved the world that he gave his son so that there would be a gracious salvation available. Not to send his son to bring out, you know, judgment. That's coming at the second coming. And whenever that's going to happen, it's going to happen. But for the first coming of Jesus, it was all about grace. Of course, judgment is going to come. But Jesus offers salvation and grace in his first coming. One commentator writes, obviously for Jesus, now is not the time for judgment. Rather, it is time to offer grace and to warn about accountability. And church, we're in a similar time. These last days, ever since Jesus was ascended to heaven until he comes back for a second coming, we're in the exact same place. Our job as the church is not to go around to the world and say, you're all going to die. <laughs> you know, kind of like Jonah going to Nineveh, in 40 days and you're done. Yes, do we warn? Do we tell them they're accountable to God? Absolutely. But what we portray is the salvation of the lost in love and in compassion. Now, are the Samaritans in the wrong? Yes. Justice is still real. Truth, right and wrong, is still real. The Samaritans are in the wrong. They're rejecting Jesus the Messiah, and there are major consequences for that. Are many today in the wrong? Absolutely. But equally wrong, which Jesus is making a point here, is our proud and our angry determination to smite and judge people. There's a movie that some of you have watched. We had a movie night here called Free Burma Rangers. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, but there's a really, really um, powerful moment where this main family that the documentary is um, based on, they're a missionary family, they basically, their calling is to go anywhere in the world where there is war, and they just want to help people that are suffering. So when ISIS is basically attacking so many places in Iraq, and it's like 2014, 2015, if I have my years right, they go, to, they go to Mosul, and they become basically in line with the Iraqi army who's trying to stop ISIS, and there's a scene where the Iraqi army has successfully basically liberated, uh, taken a portion back from ISIS outside of Mosul, kind of just in the little village, and this missionary family uh, gets to be a part of liberating it, which is really exciting. So there's this little hut where there was this family that has been under ISIS for many years. And there's this dad with like three or four children. And this missionary family, and it's all documented on video camera, it's really powerful. They go and they're able to open the door and say, hey, we're, you're liberated from ISIS. You're liberated from this, these, these uh, evil uh, men that have been like holding you captive. And they were overjoyed, just so happy, just singing, like just amazing. Little, ki little kids, just like this is so, so good. And they hop in their tractor and they're leaving, right? They weren't going to go see family or whatever. And they're leaving down the road. And what they didn't know is that ISIS, when they left, they just planted landmines. Just all as they left. It's the kind of people they are. And the tractor hits a landmine and just explodes. So the missionary family and some of the Iraqi army, they run down to see what the carnage has done. And, and it's just, I'll spare you the details, but it's terrible. And one of the little girls just lied dead. And it's so sad. And the main, the husband of the family, it's so good because it's so real. And he just looks at the camera and he says, listen, this, is just, this, is, this just happened. He says, I'm going to kill every ISIS member. That's what I'm going to do. They're wicked men. I'm going to kill them all. So you have this justified anger of injustice, right? Very much justified. I'm going to kill them all. This is ridiculous. We just, this little girl was just hugging his leg, being liberated, and now she's lying dead because of ISIS, because of what they've done. So he's not going to kill them all. But that night, God speaks to him and says, no. That's not, this, is not your, this is not your job, and this is not that time. This is a time of love and a time of forgiveness. And that's just amazing for him to work through that. And maybe some of us have to work through that as well, like James and John. Should we smite them? Should we call down fire from heaven? They're, they're rejecting us. This is wrong. No, because now is not the time for that. That's coming but it's not the time for that. And that doesn't fit in your hands. Your description is to go and like Jesus and show compassion and love and the way of salvation. Your job is to forgive those ISIS members, to forgive them and love them because God made them and God loves those men that planted those landmines. Really, really powerful. So what's the solution for us in the issue of letting anger and pride stump our mission? Well, again, it's to set our eyes on Jesus when our mission is rejected. What did Jesus do when he was rejected? Luke 23, 34. Father, forgive them. They don't, they don't know what they're doing. Forgive them. 
Father, forgive ISIS. They don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive this person that's, that's abused me. They don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive. Forgive. We're not beyond discipleship church. This is what we are made to do. This is what we are called to do. Our mission is absolutely essential and we need to set our faces to it. But tribalism, anger, pride, revenge will seek to stifle our convictions. But we can abolish their power. We can abolish the power of anger and pride and tribalism and revenge. We can abolish that power they have over us by setting our eyes on Jesus, the compassionate one, the one who will come and bring justice to all. But there is a hidden key to all of this. Not that hidden, but um, hidden key makes it sound a little bit more spicy. So hidden key is this. In verse 55, your translation might say this. You, Jesus says, you do not know what manner of spirit you are. For the Son of Man came not to destroy people's lives, but to save them. Does your translation say that? Maybe in a footnote or something like that. Some manuscripts have them, some don't. But that's so true what that footnote says. You see, James and John didn't have the Spirit yet. They had it in part, but not full. That wouldn't come until Pentecost. The Spirit that anointed Jesus, the Son of Man, is the same Spirit that Jesus had the authority and the privilege to bestow upon His church when He was raised and exalted to the right hand of the Father. He bestowed the same Spirit that He was anointed with upon all of the church. You see, our old spirit is one of fear, one of pride, one of anger, one of hostility, of revenge. But God's Spirit in us produces the fruits of love and the fruits of joy and peace and patience and kindness, goodness and faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. That is what the Spirit produces in the church or what it ought to produce in us. And oftentimes we can grieve the Holy Spirit's work of fruits in us. But this is the Spirit that we have received. The same Spirit that gives us the power and the authority to preach and to heal and to cast out and deliver is the same Spirit that produces in us the love and the compassion and the kindness and the joy and the forgiveness that even those that don't deserve it, we give. So how can we set our face on mission and our eyes on Jesus and live that out? By the Spirit of God in us. So as we jump back into Luke Church, as we see much of what Jesus is going to teach us as we follow him, we're going to come alongside of him and set our faces to Jerusalem. For us, we're going to set our faces on mission to the new Jerusalem. And we're going to set our eyes on Jesus. Do you want to grab Brittany, Raph, and let's pray, and then we'll uh, finish in a song. Oh, Father, thank you for everything that you taught us today from your word. And Lord, I pray that if there's anything that uh, was said today that just was not just not of you, Lord, that that would just not uh, stick with anybody, but only that which was of you. And we know for sure the scripture that we read, that is of you. So Lord, we just pray that anything that is of you would just stick to all of our hearts today. But I pray, Father, that by your spirit, we would not be like the person who looks at the word and sees ourselves and yet turns away from the word and forgets. Lord, we want to be those that look into the perfect word hear your voice, turn and do your voice. Just like you, Jesus, you would hear from your Father and say what you heard. You would see what your Father was doing and you would do exactly that. You were the exact imprint of him. You were the image of God, the perfect mirror of God. And Father, you have called each and every one of us to be those living mirrors those living statues who through Jesus and what Jesus has done on the cross for us can actually live and and reflect who you are, Father. And as we set our faces, God, on mission, help us keep our eyes on your son Jesus who is our model and our teacher and help us remember that the spirit, the same spirit that fills and filled Jesus on earth is the same spirit that fills each and every one of us. And Father, we pray for that love and the joy and the peace and the kindness and forgiveness that flowed out of you, Jesus, while you lived on earth would also flow out of us today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. Well, if you can stand to your feet.
And uh, we're going to finish in, in song today.